Um, welcome to our live stream uh, about healthcare. Um, I'm Julia Newman. I've been sending you all of these emails for the past few weeks, uh, and I'm joined here with by Amelia Keegan, uh, who is our legislative director for domestic policy and our lead lobbyist on healthcare issues. Um, she's been pretty busy these past few weeks, um, uh, but she is very excited to be here with you to give you um, an update on what's happening here in DC with the American Healthcare Act, um, and also talk about why we're so opposed to this piece of legislation and why it's so important that you go to your congressional offices um, this April and participate in this. So thank you so much for joining us and so much for joining our whole um, advocacy training program that we're running right now. Um, after Amelia gives us this update, we'll go ahead and um, get into the questions that you submitted online. And at the end, if there's time, uh, you can hopefully use the chat function um, to if you have other questions for us. So uh, I'll pass it over to Amelia. Amelia, what is happening? <laughs> Thanks, Julia. Well, first, I just want to say huge, huge thank you for um, signing up, for getting involved, and for um, doing this advocacy, especially um, talking with your members of Congress on this super, super important issue. Um, extremely, extremely timely. Uh, a lot is going on, and we need your voices like no other um, uh, on this on healthcare right now. And the uh, spring uh, April recess is going to be such an important time on healthcare. Uh, I can't emphasize that enough. So I just wanted to start. I thought I'd start out by just sharing a little bit. As Julie said, what's happening in D.C.? A lot has been going on. It's like every day is something new. So first of all, about uh, two and a half weeks ago, we saw uh, kind of the repeal and replacement plan uh, uh, introduced in the House. Uh, it is called the American Health Care Act. And um, so this bill, what, let's first, what's in this bill? Let's first kind of go through some of the key things. And at, at FCNL here, we've been very, very focused on the Medicaid provisions. What is it, how does it impact Medicaid? And there are two big things that it does. The first is, if you remember, the Affordable Care Act expanded Medicaid to those in those states that cho chose to take up the Medicaid expansion, 31 states plus the District of Columbia, to cover 90% of the cost of covering people up to 138% of the poverty level. So this ensured an additional about 11 million people. What the, uh, the American Health Care Act, this new repeal and replace bill that's come out, uh, gets rid of that. It eliminates that in 2020, um, and states can still continue to provide coverage for those who were, um, uh, coverage for people up to 138% of the poverty level if they'd like, but they don't, the, the federal government's not gonna provide that 90% um, coverage of the cost. So basically, you're ending the, the uh, Medicaid expansion. The second thing is, and this is such a fundamental kind of uh, change and dismantling of the Medicaid program. It institutes a per capita cap on the program. Basically, it says each state, we're just going to get you a set amount of money uh, based on the number of people who qualify for Medicaid in your state. And that amount is just going to go up uh, at a certain rate that we're going to pick. And the ultimate kind of end goal of this is over time, uh, the federal government contributes less and less. So essentially, it's a dramatic cut in the Medicaid program. Overall, the CBO estimates that uh, this bill cuts Medicaid by $880 billion over 10 years. And if, and if states want to continue to provide the coverage and the services of Medicaid, they're going to have to come up with that extra money, which states are not in a position to do. So it's a, this is a huge, huge dramatic change for the Medicaid program, essentially ending the program as we know it. Um, so that is, uh, uh, the CBO also came out and said about 14 million people would lose Medicaid coverage because of this bill. 
So that's the, that's the Medicaid part. That's the piece that we're really focusing on. The second piece of what this bill does is we're kind of looking at uh, some of the things that it does, both in the employer uh, market, but the individual market. And so I'll just mention a couple things about what happens in the individual market. So it gets rid of the individual mandate. So there will no longer be, you know, you're not, not going to be penalized by the government if you don't, uh, if you don't have health insurance. However, um, if you lapse in coverage, if you have a lapse in coverage for two months or more, uh, insurance companies can jack up your premiums by 30%. So rather than you still sort of have a fine for not having coverage. Um, but that money just goes to the insurance companies rather than the federal government. Um, it also dismantles um, a lot of the financial assistance for premiums and for cost sharing for low income families. They provide very, very skimpy uh, benefits and it's based on your age. It's not based on income or how much your premiums are. And for the most part, this assistance is dramatically less than what people are actually um, getting now under the Affordable Care Act and, and what it actually uh, costs to be able to um, for, for uh, affordable health coverage. So um, and the, the additional thing I'll just mention is it really promotes uh, health savings accounts which allow you to kind of save money tax free uh, for health uh, care expenditures. The thing is for many people who are living paycheck to paycheck that doesn't help you if you don't have additional money to put away. And if you're in a really low uh, tax bracket or not paying any income taxes, that um, those uh, tax benefits don't help you as much, right? So those that's just sort of a very, very broad overview of what's in the bill and why we have such problems with it. Um, I thought maybe I'd say a little bit about where we are in the process. So uh, the bill came out uh, and uh, then it went through the Energy and Commerce Committee and the Ways and Means Committee. Each had to mark up their pieces of the bill. Uh, so that happened, passed out of both committees uh, under party line votes. Uh, and then actually today, uh, right, uh, the, the House Budget Committee combined those two bills together and reported it out so that it can go to the House floor. In the interim on Monday, we saw the CBO score came out um, that the Congressional Budget Office that does all the kind of impartial scoring of what, what the consequences are of, of this bill. And it found, as you probably read in the news, 24 million people will lose uh, health coverage uh, uh, by uh, 2026. So a pretty, pretty harsh um, uh, kind of analysis. Uh, and then, as I said, again, they also found that it will cut Medicaid by $880 billion over 10 years. Um, so the House Budget Committee just reported their, uh, this bill out. It's going to go to the Rules Committee. They can make a few uh, uh, changes to it before it goes to the House floor. And then we expect this to be on the House floor next week. They really want to move this out of the House very quickly and get it onto the Senate floor. So. What we've been hearing from uh, leaders in Congress is uh, many of the Republican leadership really wants to get this done by the April recess, but uh, there's a lot in the way. This is a very, very controversial bill. So just what are, what are the different pieces here and what needs to happen to fall into place for this to be able to pass? So this bill has, uh, it's, again, many of you have probably read in the news, You've got those on the right, and within the Republican Party, you've got those on the right, um, the Freedom Caucus, who is very upset about this bill because um, they say it, it, they are calling it Obamacare light. They're, they don't like the fact that it includes these uh, tax subsidies at all. They don't like, they want the Medicaid expansion to actually be uh, eliminated even earlier, not wait until 2020. Um, and so they uh, are, are have very strong reservations about this bill. Uh, and in the, the, in the Republican Party in the House, uh, assuming that all the Democrats vote against this bill, there can only be 21 defections of the Republican caucus in the House. So that's a big question of um, kind of what they'll do. 
The other piece is you have a lot of moderates in the Republican caucus as well, who also have very strong reservations. Many of them are from Medicaid expansion states. And so the elimination of the Medicaid expansion would severely harm uh, a lot of people and, and lead to a lot of people in their states and in their districts losing health care coverage. And so they're very concerned about that. Many of them are also concerned about this Medicaid per capita cap and fundamentally like ending uh, the current financing structure of that program um, and really making it uh, much less responsive to increases in health care costs or if there's some sort of spike in um, some sort of uh, epidemic or outbreak or something. And then third is many of them realize that, you know, the subsidies or the tax credits just really aren't enough, especially for low income families. So we're likely to see some changes um, as this bill moves forward, but it's very unclear what this will, let, will be like. Um, and then the question is, if it passes the House, can it pass the Senate? A lot of uncertainty there. So um, that's kind of what we're looking at. So what can you do right what where do we need you right now um so we're really hoping to be able to delay uh these votes we want to get to the re april recess without this having passed both the house and the senate um and your meeting request alone is an indication to your members of congress hey i have serious reservations about what's going on here and i want to be able to talk to you about this so that's that's huge that meeting request alone is a signal. And then when we see if this does go to the floor uh, of the House for a vote, your representative will be taking a vote on this and they need to hear from you um, what you think of that vote. Accountability is so, so key in the relationship with your members of Congress. And then if we don't have a final bill that's passed both the House and the Senate in the same form, then I think it's this is a really important time to come and say, listen, we need to make sure that if we're repealing uh, the Affordable Care Act, that there really is an adequate replacement in place before we repeal this. And this right now is not that. And I think you can especially highlight the concerns around Medicaid, repealing the Medicaid expansion. We have to make sure that we maintain that Medicaid expansion so that individuals, low income individuals who are under 138 percent of the poverty line can still get affordable, adequate coverage. And the second thing is we shouldn't be fundamentally dismantling that Medicaid program through a Medicaid per capita cap. So opposing a Medicaid per capita cap, I think, is really, really important. So that's kind of the ask we're pushing. If for some reason we totally fail and we've, we've seen the, this pass through before the April recess, we will certainly be coming in back to kind of revise our talking points and what you need to be saying. But rest assured, whatever Congress does in the next couple weeks, you, what you say to your members of Congress on this issue could, I mean, could not be more important. It is absolutely critical. The timing right now couldn't be more important. Um, so the next, these weeks and these uh, months ahead are just some of the most important ones we've seen around healthcare and around Medicaid um, in, in, in really a generation. Yeah, thanks so much, Amelia. Um, she really knows her stuff, as you can see. So I have a few questions yes. for you. Um, that was so great, but, um, I'm, so Democrats right now are like totally united in opposition to this issue. So is there a purpose in visiting um, a Democrat who's already come out against this? Um, and what's the best way to like make use of uh, their time and uh, all of our advocates time in that situation? Right. Great question. Well, I think it's always important to go and talk to your members of Congress wherever they are on an issue. First of off is they need to know that they've got backing in the district, that their constituents are really for them um, and, and really do oppose this legislation. And they need to know that. And a lot of members of Congress, you know, are hearing pushback on, you know, their premiums having gone up a lot. Um, there's been, you know, instability in the individual market within, um, within health care. And so um, they've, many of them have gotten that pushback. So letting them know that you've got their back and that uh, you are very much 100% in support of them opposing this legislation. So that's really important. 
The other thing that's really important is to strategize. And you can tell kind of, you can let your members of Congress kind of know what you're working on and get from them an idea of, okay, where do you need most, most help in kind of defeating this legislation? Who are the other members that we really need to be getting to? And that's information that you can then share with us and can be really, really helpful as we kind of strategize, okay, where do we need to be making sure that we're um, getting uh, calls into offices or getting getting onto the Hill? Who do we need to be talking to? What are the points that are really resonating or not resonating? And the third piece is, I think the Medicaid kind of argument is really, really essential. Um, it, it tends to get lost in some of the other kind of Parts. When we talk about the Affordable Care Act, most people talk about, you know, pre-existing conditions and being able to stay on your parents' plan until they, until you're 26, um, lifetime caps, a lot of popular provisions like that. Very few people talk about kind of Medicaid and certainly something like the Medicaid per capita cap, which is just going to lead to just billions and billions of dollars cut from the Medicaid uh, program in a way that's really going to dismantle it and uh, hinder it from uh, being uh, the effective kind of health coverage that it is in the future. And so I think lifting that up is that needs to be a really, really strong priority moving forward is absolutely critical. Great, yeah. Um, and so can uh, one of the questions we got was just kind of about the arguments that the Republicans are making in favor of this plan, right, the idea that more people, young people will be coming into the market because uh, plans will be cheaper and there will be more opportunities for um, young people, young healthier people to get the kind of health care that they are looking for. Um, what are we saying in response to that argument and what's the best response? Sure, so um, a couple things. One is uh, it's true that there will be some cheaper plans. They're gonna be much skimpier plans, but there will be cheaper plans out there. But the thing is, is that the subsidies that help people afford those plans are much, much more reduced. So the amount that people are actually going to be paying, um, for the most part, is going to be higher than they are now. So I think that's a that's a key piece. Um, the other part is that uh, I, I think it's important to look at what is happening in the um, what what this bill does for the individual. Um, mandate and kind of as I was explaining before yes you can you know choose uh, not to have coverage or you can buy a much cheaper plan if you would like but if you go without coverage right there's no penalty and it's harder to get back in right so then all of a sudden your premium can go up by 30 percent if you have a drop in coverage and now that's going to sort of block people especially people who have um, higher health care costs um, and uh, could face even much, much higher premiums from getting back in. So this would essentially create uh, a much bigger problem around what we call, um, uh, well, we'll just say it just, it, it creates these escalating costs, leaving people who are sicker um, and uh, have pre-existing conditions kind of uh, segmented, uh, whereas uh, healthier, uh, younger people are often choosing to opt out. Great, thanks. And so the last question I have is just, what's having the biggest impact in offices right now? What kind of stories are really making a big difference to members and really what? why are so many Republicans, um, uh, especially in the Senate, hesitating to support this legislation? That's a great question. I mean, those personal stories make a huge, huge difference. Um, so people talking about kind of what would happen if they lost access to um, affordable quality coverage. Um, so I think that is uh, very, very powerful. So whatever you can bring to the table on that is, um, is very, very important. I think the Medicaid piece is another uh, piece again, whereas, you know, Medicaid, it helps such a huge, 70 million people on, on Medicaid. And I know um, it helps a lot of uh, you know, it's not just low income families, it's people with disabilities, it's people, um, it's the elderly. And so just the idea of that no longer being a responsive or effective uh, health coverage program is truly, truly scary. 
So kind of talking, if, if you have direct experience with the Medicaid program, I think definitely bringing that in. Um, and certainly, you know, I, th I think the other thing is just what it would mean to for the Medicaid expansion uh, piece to to um, to uh, disappear. disappear. Yes, thank you. Uh, and and what that would mean for so many people who would no longer have access to affordable quality coverage. So those sorts of stories, I think, are really really powerful. But just how important this is to you, why this is so important to you, um, and the fact that you're a constituent. I mean, those things are more important than anything. Great. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. That, this is really great and super informative. And thanks to all of you uh, who have joined us or uh, either live here or um, later when you get this in your email. Um, your advocacy is just so, so important on this issue. And we are so thankful uh, that we have so many people around the country who uh, are standing up and, you know, making sure their voices are heard. So uh, thanks so much. And I'll see you next week. Thank you.